from simply using Coulomb's law to find the electric field due to a point charge where this Q here is the source charge we can expand this idea of the point charge to charge the distribution of any other shape through the use of integration it's pretty much the exact same thing which is to add up a whole bunch of them and so I'm going to use this fairly simple example of a rod with a uniform charge distribution and talk about how we can use integration to find the electric field near this rod. So the whole key idea of using integration is because the only quote unquote formula available to us works for point charges, when you have any other shape, what we do is we cut these shapes up into many, many tiny chunks such as each little chunk looks more or less like a point. To demonstrate that, we can just choose one of these chunks and see what kind of electric field it has on this over here. Let's set this up as my x-axis. So we can redraw the situation with just that one particular segment. We'll call x equals zero over here and p is over here. And we know that due to the information given is, is at the x position of l plus a. Or you can also more properly say that the position of vector of P is L plus A in the I hat direction, given that the X direction is there. Then the segment over here looks more or less like a point because it's a very small chunk. It will have a certain amount of charge on it, which we'll call DQ. It will have a certain length, which we'll call DX because it's in the X direction in this case. And it'll also have a certain position and we'll just call that generally X. Or you can say that the R, let's call it Rx, it's equal to X in the I hat. So if we want the electric field, assuming it's positive, let's say it is positive for now, it'll give us a small part of the overall electric field. A small segment gives us a small bit of electric field. So then the little bit of electric field given here, that's just like point charge. So we got K multiplied by DQ over R, R here being from the X to the point, from the source to the point, so given the direction of xp, that of course is squared. So once we have this expression, then the matter of getting the entire electric field is just we sum them up. So there, we'll add an integral sign in there in a little bit. But before that, let's sub in these various things so we can come up with a proper integral that we can evaluate. First of all, let's deal with dq. It even tells us that dq is lambda dx. Well, how does that work? What we're saying is the charge is uniformly distributed through the whole thing. So basically, if we take a fraction of the length, we're taking the same fraction of the charge. So basically what we're saying is dq is the overall q, but we're only taking the dx part over the whole length, where we're going to call q over l as lambda which we call the linear charge density. And this idea of a charge density versus an overall charge is going to be helpful when we start to look at things that are, say, infinitely long, which would imply that has an infinite amount of charge somehow, but it's, the, it's going to be the density of that charge that's going to matter in terms of how much electric field we're going to see. So we have this, that piece. It has a dx in it, which is great, which means we will be integrating with respect to x that we're used to rather than dq up there. Then the last piece is of course, like always, we need to figure out the displacement vector between our source and our point, which is our p minus our x. And this is why I've been stressing the unit vector notation all this time, because in this case, our x is going to be changing and it might even change sign. But in this case, it's uh, quite nice that it doesn't change sign, but we can still take care of the direction using our unit vector. And so that's L plus A minus X, all in the I hat direction. And so clearly the unit vector then is just in the I hat direction. So now with all the pieces, we replace all this. Let's rewrite that down here. The E, then we have lambda, the X over L plus A minus X, all square in the I hat direction. Then to find the overall contribution, all we have to do is we have to go from our start to our end. So we integrate because we're integrating X. So we need the X at the start and X at the end. What's the X start? 
going to be 0, because that's where we start. And the xn is going to be L. So we replace this with 0 to L. There. We end up with an integral that hopefully we can do. But up to this point, it's the very important part of how to set up the integral properly by considering the charge distribution, what is the little bit of charge that we're standing for, and for that particular point, what, how do we represent the displacement vector in terms of the x or y or whichever variable we're going to be integrating against, as well as the unit vector also express symbolically using the unit vector notation. That's how we set up the integral. And there will be questions where I will just ask you to set up the integral without evaluating it because some of the integral can be really ugly and messy. Up to this point, this is the physics. And then now we're going to do some math to find out what this integral actually evaluates to. In this case, the integral isn't that ugly, so let's do it together. So here I'm going to rewrite a little bit. So then the entire e is equal to the integral of all these little e. And I'm just going to take out anything that doesn't relate to x out of the integral, right? k is a constant, that's always the same. Uh, lambda, in this case, it's a constant charge distribution for every single point in x. That stays the same. The direction also stays the same. Because as we go from start to end, every single point is going to be to the left of point P. And therefore, the electric field will point to the positive i direction for every single point that we're interested in, leaving us with just 1 over L plus A minus X all square dx. So in order to do this, we need a simple substitution because right now we have x trapped into this term, which is all square. So it looks a little ugly and we can't directly use our power rule. So let's change it up a little bit and make it look a little nicer. And this is a simple substitution. So this should look familiar to you if you have covered this in your calculus class already. This here is the ugly part of the equation. So let's call that u, which is great because we, if we replace that with u, we just have 1 over u squared, which, which is probably easier to take the integral off. But let's see what the repercussion of that. So first, we have to define u, so that. And then we have to also not only replace every instance of x that we see, but also have to replace dx. So to get dx, we have to implicitly differentiate this expression on both sides. So du is equal to something with respect to x, so meaning l is going to give us 0, a is going to give us 0, so we have minus dx. So we pick up a negative sign. So dx is actually negative du. That replace everything in this part here. But don't forget, we also have to replace the limits of our integration. So the u start is going to be l plus a minus x start because of the definition up here. So in that case, L plus A minus 0, which is just L plus A. And UN is equal to L plus A minus L, which gives us A. Now it looks a little funny because it seems like we're going backwards, so to speak. But that is just a function of the fact that we're replacing U with something with negative X in it. If we follow everything through, everything's going to work out. So we go ahead and replace all those stuff. So our u n is just a, and we have l plus a. 1 over now is u square, and then it becomes negative du. We can rewrite one more time just to make it even more obvious how to integrate this. We'll take the negative out, and we'll write this as a negative power. And we simply have a power, we just use the power rule, and we can take this integral. The power rule states that we need to increase the power by 1, so negative 2 becomes negative 1, and then this power power in front would have came down, so we have to undo its effects by introducing a negative, so that when we derive this, we will get positive u to negative 2, keeping our limits out here. We can actually take the negatives out and cancel, so bam bam, the i hat 1 over a minus 1 over l plus a. And let's rewrite the final answer, because that is the final answer, so then the overall e at point p due to the entire line of charge as we integrate it for every single point now we've added up all those little contribution and it seems to make sense in the sense that we have 1 over a which has a smaller denominator therefore 
a bigger number minus something with a bigger denominator, so that's a small number, which will end when you subtract them, you get out with a positive number. So therefore, the E does in fact point towards a positive I direction, which if you look back in the original diagram, that's what we expect, right? Because if Q here is positive, then the electric field should point away from it, meaning it's giving you positive I. And then also, if Q was somehow negative, what would happen is, if Q is negative, then lambda is going to be negative, and then EP is going to be in the negative I direction. So I guess that's, this can be the unit vector. And so everything makes sense. If we keep track of the unit vector prop, then the direction will be tracked for us directly. And so there it is. The electric field due to a line distribution of charge through using a fairly simple integral.